to you by Chemistry. Hello listeners and welcome back to Brought to You by Chemistry. Now, it's been a heavy series, I can't lie. You know, we've journeyed through the subject of antimicrobial resistance and we've, we've done quite well. Now, in this episode, we're going to be talking about the incredibly lighthearted topic of infection prevention and control. Yeah. Now, we're going to be going into the hardcore area of antimicrobial resistance, and taking us there are two wonderful experts, Professor Morgan Alexander, material scientist from the University of Nottingham, and Dr. Lena Sirik, senior lecturer in the Faculty of Engineering at University College London. So thank you so much for both of you for being here. I'm going to start with obviously the most difficult question. Could I please get you to introduce yourself? I'm going to start with you, Morgan. Hello, uh, I'm Morgan Alexander. I'm a material scientist who's um, taken a lot of interest in uh, materials which resist bacterial biofilm formation. Hello, I am Lena Sirik. I am um, an environmental microbiologist um, which means that I'm interested in microbes in the environment rather than necessarily microbes within and on humans or animals. Uh, I'm going to ask a question a bit off script. What is your favourite fact about the things that you work on? My favourite fun fact is mm. that we should really be embracing microbes rather than trying to get rid of them. How come? Our bodies have evolved around with them around um so it's not trying to get rid of them from our surroundings is not necessarily a very good idea um so i think it's it, we should be understanding them and embracing them and living together in harmony rather than trying to eliminate them from our surroundings all of the time it's a bit of a controversial concept but on the whole most microbes are good or don't care good or apathetic that's the best you <laughs> yeah, can hope for exactly they're not bothered they're like oh there's a human whatever uh so Morgan, <laughs> what is your your favorite fun fact about the area that you work in so i would say it's kind of related to lena's which is that um we have more bacterial cells on and in our body than we have cells that make up our body um itself and that we carry around um, large weight of bacteria at any one time uh, and as a material scientist who's moved into dealing with uh, bacteria that was one of the first things that kind of blew my mind when I learned it. So when, when someone told you that were you was your immediate response go no you're lying oh really funny why not make fun of the material the <laughs> make fun of the chemist huh? <laughs> Yeah, not not quite. It was it was that quite amazing um, things. Uh, well, facts. Uh, that's a numerical fact. Uh, seem to become apparent or become well known um, within my, my lifetime. I wasn't taught that at school. Um, it seems to have been something that was realised, or at least publicised, relatively recently. Um, and consequently, I thought, wow, I'm I'm actually living in the age of discovery of these things. And that tallies with being, you know, the, the, the great fun of being a researcher when you and your group find new things and you're amazed by it. Um, but actually that in society where we're, we're finding out things um, which are becoming commonly known, I think, you know, my kids probably know that fun fact and as to most other people, I imagine, but it, it wasn't something that was widely talked about or known. Well, with that in mind, uh, Morgan, you're going to tell us a bit more about your work because your work involves surface chemistry. And as someone that knows a bit about chemistry and is currently uh, with a laptop that is on a surface, can you explain what that is? Like why are surfaces an important part of what we're talking about today which is infection prevention and control surfaces that hold your laptop and my computer um, are load bearing pits of wood or whatever um, the bit of that surface or in fact any surface that's around us the telephone uh, computer screen the bit of that surface which is important in determining how cells will respond to it is actually only the top nanometer or two. So the very, very surface 
of any material is what has a very large impact upon the way um, uh, mammalian cells, human cells, um, respond to the surface or bacterial cells. And my group had spent um, a number of years trying to control the way um, that first couple of nanometers um, was in terms of chemical terms, what the chemistry of that first couple of nanometers was, so that we could get um, uh, human cells to stick or not to stick to certain bits of plastic. Bacteria can colonize contact lenses um, and uh, that can cause infections. Um, and so, and also more um, uh, other types of devices, which are such as uh, catheters, which you might use to draw blood, um, or uh, urinary catheters to, to avoid the, the bladder um, for people who can't use the toilet in a normal way. And so, all of those things jumped out at us as a need. And so, we turned our science around and started to look at what. Um, surface chemistry might stop bacteria attaching. Now, Lena early on talked about bacteria um, being um, often not um, bad, um, and we, we entirely agree. And, and trying to kill them is something that we didn't want to do because people know that when you try and kill bacteria, you can actually select for the nastiest ones, the ones that you don't manage to kill, and those those will be the ones that remain. And we took an approach of trying to find a surface chemistry which prevented the bacteria. Initially, we thought about preventing them sticking in the terms I've just mentioned earlier on. But then we got to thinking that actually um, we wanted to stop them forming what's called a biofilm. And a biofilm is something where bacteria uh, form a slime city, as people have called them, by excreting polymeric substances, um, which are polysaccharides and other substances which protect them from the host defense. So the, if you had a contact lens and uh, you, you got bacteria on it, then uh, some of the host cells might try and clear those bacteria off. And if there is individual bacteria, that, that, that can be achieved quite readily. But if you've got them in one of these biofilms, that's a real problem. And so we focused our research on trying to prevent biofilm formation. I'm going to touch on a few things here. One, that you went from uh, contact lens to catheter to urinary catheter, which is the three scariest places that I think mm. uh, I wouldn't want sort of microbes. And he's holding up a urinary catheter. Mate, what is in your office? Hey. No, have you had that in while we've had in this conversation? I see this. Right. Fortunately, mm. I don't that yet was... have to use a urinary right. catheter, so, but it so, may not be so... long. So what um, <laughs> listeners, of course, this is an audio medium you can't see, is he's, he's, hold, he's held up a urinary catheter, and then he's held up something else. That oh, yeah, the other thing is, looks almost... It looks, no, no, I'm going to say what it looks like. It looks like um, a prophylactic from the Middle Ages. <laughs> <laughs> a reusable one. That's what it looks like. With it's, that in mind, Lena... <laughs> <laughs> with i mean first things first are you as weirded out as i am by everything that morgan said no i'm not oh. weirded out by any of it at all i oh, and no. i'm pleasantly surprised by some of it as well a, a lot of materials discovery and work within the sort of antimicrobial arena has been about killing um and it's yeah it's refreshing to hear something different so your area of expertise, you're looking at sort of this environmental microbiology and yeah. you think about this sort of healthy infrastructure. And Morgan yeah. mentioned like the fact that you've got like the first couple of nanometers are the things you really have to worry about and, you know, preventing microbes making biofilms and stuff. So with that sort of context in mind, with your work looking at sort of infrastructure, is it just a case of making sure the first couple of nanometers are fine and that everything is great? My work is a lot more macro than than the nano world that Morgan is talking about. So, you know, I, I work in infection control, not necessarily in the traditional sense of infection prevention and control within hospitals just, but within the buildings that we live in. And I do do a lot of work with hospitals because they have a lot of expertise in that area. And of course, they're more interested than other um, facilities, managers, I guess, to to know about the microbial world within their spaces. 
So, yeah, I think my, my work is a lot more macro. So it goes from, you know, sampling surfaces and water and air in hospitals. We've also done it in um, other public spaces like on the tube um, and on buses. This, you know, COVID opened the doors um, for people like me to really be able to sample all sorts of weird and wonderful places, which um, was wonderful and tiring. But yeah, I also work on a more micro scale as well. So um, I'm working on, well, one of my PhD students is looking at how the environment influences the transfer of antibiotic resistance genes between different species and whether, you know, you get more uh, mating between species if it's hotter or if it's cooler or if there's um, antibiotics uh, in, in the space that they're in as well um and then i've done a we, we do a bit of antimicrobial strategies testing as well so materials that have been discovered uh the impact of and I, you wouldn't necessarily think of ventilation as an antimicrobial strategy but it it is among other things it is also an antimicrobial strategy so what impact does ventilation have on the air on the microbes in the air in a particular space um does introducing those screens that everyone's put in during and and since covid you know between i don't know the um the till and and people coming into a shop do they actually make a difference um can i get the answer to that because I'm, as a man whose <laughs> hearing is not very good i find those infuriating yeah yeah I yeah to get my head down to the hole in the bottom to put my ear through to hear what they're going, yeah. what people are saying on so are the, they beneficial or not the answer is predictably complex. So, <laughs> so yes and no. Um, if if the room has bad ventilation, then they do do something. Okay. Um, and especially with the sort of larger droplets that that people mm -hmm. they'll come out of people's mouths when they do whatever they do. Um, if the ventilation, if there is ventilation present, so if there's um, you know, air coming in and out, or if there's air conditioning in particular airflows, then it becomes a little bit more complicated. So if there's good, a good level of changing of air, so replacing the air with new fresh air from outside, from outdoors, then the screens do very little. But there's also, there's also a lot to do with air flows. So depending on where you put your screen and where your in ventilation inlets and outlets are, you might cause weird sort of airflows which whip the aerosols and droplets around in unpredictable ways so yeah uh you know we really thought like well you know how how complicated can this be you put a thing in the way surely it stops stuff so for the avoidance of risk we're probably going to have them forever now yes exactly yeah and i think you know good vent actually changing air rather than um recirculating it really makes a big difference so i mean with that in mind because that's actually a really key and interesting point uh, i'm gonna jump back um, to you morgan for this because lena mentioned you know a lot about all these different places you know buses the tube inside hospitals those are different areas they have very much different design requirements you don't have the same sort of material that you have on the tube that you would say in a and e thank god for that um because i don't know if you've been on the central line recently it's like dante's ninth the circle of hell um so it's also are... my line it's one of, it's a it's a favorite <laughs> exactly it's uh for anyone who isn't london based um you what you got to understand is the central line runs through the center of london from east to west and if you fall asleep on it you can either end up in essex or past Heathrow which isn't particularly nice um Morgan when it comes to this what are sort of the different things that chemists and material scientists can do with respect to like surfaces and infection prevention because sort of the stuff I'm thinking about is well I know that well I've heard that things like you know gold or copper or I know honey are antibacterial antimicrobial is it a case of just coating surfaces with a, a thin layer of materials that are sort of antimicrobial and that everything is fine people have certainly 
taken um, various strategies to uh, investigate the effectiveness of kidding strategies on touch, what are called touch surfaces, which is really Dana's ballpark. And, um, for, but from a chemistry perspective, they have tended to be kidding strategies, um, as far as I'm aware, such as chlorhexidine, which you might know from your mouthwash, for example, going old style and using copper um, for door handles, um, which has an antimicrobial effect. In addition to touch surfaces, as was mentioned briefly, um, filter um, filters, uh, which um, are on current trains. Felicity de Kogan, who's uh, doing studies on trains now and extracting um, the bacterial, well, extracting whatever comes off filters um, and looking at what effect um, using modified filter materials have. Our technology that we're applying within within medical devices, that hasn't been explored uh, in the environment yet, but we think there is great opportunity for that. I mean, you mentioned the materials that you find in the tube compared to the operating theater. You may find actually that the polymers used might not be too dissimilar in that the, uh, of course, what they're coated in and what they, what the so the environmental contamination that falls on them will be very difficult different so but uh, uh there are often uh, things like perspex which you you, you know from these covers that's a uh, uh, a polymethyl methacrylate is to give it its technical name um, or plexiglass i think the americans tend to call it um that sort of material um and and its chemical relations are, are commonly used in in coatings and um, uh, also for screens and things. And, and that, the materials we're using in the um, biomedical context are also um, acrylates and methacrylates sort of related chemically to, uh, to those sort of very common uh, materials that you find in the environment. Morgan's work is very much at the nanoscale. And I guess, you know, f- for me, that is that is super interesting. And it's almost getting to the point where you're, you're specifically looking at the interaction at that at that scale the microbe is massive <laughs> um so you're looking at the specific surface interactions between the microbes um the microbial cell you know its cell wall any sort of uh pores that it might have on it and and so on um and at the micro scale surfaces um have a topography you know that they have a topography that we with the naked eye can't see. So, for example, we think of of stainless steel as a really smooth surface, but actually it's quite ridged and the ridges are certainly big enough for microbial cells to get stuck within them and, and, you know, sit there or, I don't know, depending on what the environmental conditions are, they might even multiply potentially. The way you said multiply there was <laughs> in the same way that like my my uh, my head teacher in secondary school said on this school trip there'll be no canoodling. Uh-huh, so, uh... Yeah, no multiplying, please. Thank you. So what we're saying is these materials, even though with the naked eye we see them as you know really smooth yes. and really fine, they're actually this. They've got a micro environment. They're really yeah, bumpy, really exactly. rigid. Exactly. Exactly. Things can fit and stuff can happen. Um, And, you know, thinking about the tube, the worst surfaces, as far as I'm concerned, on the tube, and now I have evidence that this is the case, are the plush, fluffy, you know, the seats, or sometimes you get the, you get a bit of it on the armrests as well yeah because yeah, those yeah, we, are we, you know we, we, we all knew that <laughs> yeah exactly we've always known i can put a number on it now ha. but um sorry because uh, um roughness or topography or little um, grooves and places for bacteria to hide that were just sort of described to you have always been thought of as being a bad thing for bacterial um, colonization of surfaces. But we recently um, had a very exciting result whereby we tested lots of different computer generated topographies and found that in certain cases, uh, when you had certain uh, features, uh, we managed at the micro scale, the sort of um, five to 20 micron scale, uh, that you could actually counterintuitively reduce bacterial biofilm colonization of surfaces, um, which is very mm-hmm. exciting. And we're in the process of trying to, to understand how 
and why that actually works. What's, I mean, what's really interesting, like you say, you both work at very different scales here. Um, I've sort of got two questions wrapped up in one uh, for you, Lena. First okay. up is with these sort of these techniques, these materials, these processes that people like Morgan look at at a sort of very, very uh, micro level, very nano level, can we take sort of that and then put them into these spaces, into these sort of buildings and just make everything fine? And then sort of my second question from that is, if you do these things, if you, you know, apply materials or apply techniques to certain buildings, certain offices, certain sort of surfaces, can you end up getting, you know, bacteria, getting microbes that can become resistant to a, you know, to a specific surface type? Probably we can't make everything fine by just making all surfaces antimicrobial. I think there's there's a real lack of evidence of how effective um, antimicrobial surfaces, whether they're killing or whether they're um, you know just repelling microbes, how effective they are in the real world. Because you know we we test these things in the lab, and I think a lot of companies who make antimicrobial things they have to comply to a specific ISO standard, and that ISO standard states that you test these things against you know this list of microbes in this way in the laboratory and if you get this result then it's a winner if you don't then it's not but the real world is very different to a laboratory um one because it's th there is so much more complexity environmentally so you know grease and grime and um uh, other things things in the in the environment uh, weather conditions humidity temperature all of these things but then also the way people interact with surfaces so you know it's it's re it's quite straightforward to design something that works in the lab but actually how well it might work in the real world and the weird and wonderful ways that people might decide to use that device or surface or whatever um, can be unpredictable and then, and then you get something you weren't expecting. Yeah, it depends. So we don't really know very much about resistance to surfaces. We know about building resistance to the agents that might be uh, either impregnated into a surface or sitting on top of a surface or something like that. And it depends on the agent in, in this case. So, you know, there's definitely been, there's definitely evidence about resistance to silver um, and, and other, and chlor certainly chlorhexidine, you know, these, um, uh, there's another one that's very used a lot, benzalkonium chloride, which is in Dettol and a lot of the surface wipes and I don't know what else. So yeah, definitely, it's sort of, it depends how, it interacts with the microbe. It If it interacts with a very specific bit of the microbe, like, I don't know, part of a, a protein or a part of a protein, you know, these things multiply constantly, right? So it's they, they evolve very quickly and they are very good at always being a number of steps ahead of us. So I think there will always be this arms race, uh, but we can be a bit smarter about it. No, I was going to say, Morgan, in terms of being smarter about it, what do we know at sort of a very, very small scale? Can can bacteria, can microbes become resistant to surfaces, you know, like silver, like cloth, hexa, blah, blah, blah? You know, is that a, <laughs> is that possible? In terms of um, silver resistance of bacteria, which bacteria have developed, that certainly would equally be possible if you had a, device which was using silver to kill bacteria by virtue of the fact that they develop um, a resistance to that. In terms of the approach that we've been using where we prevent biofilm formation, in the lab we've uh, looked to see if we can develop resistance to that um, and we, we haven't found significant resistance being built up but as Lena pointed out, the environment um, and um, where these devices are deployed um, can be quite different in reality because it's a complex situation. Okay, okay. And so with that, um, that sort of leads nicely into my next question with, you know, if, it, if it's so complex to create surfaces that are naturally antibacterial, um, is it better to go for that route rather than just, you know, having better cleaning methods what's the difference between sort of making a surface that is itself 
antibacterial versus just having very, very good cleaning processes, really wiping things down, really, you know, steam cleaning, autoclaving. We tend try, to try not to steam clean um, people's medical devices or uh, although, of course, contact things are autoclaved. Lenses. Yes. <laughs> um, so, I mean, actually, the, the, the contact lens is a really nice example of where surface chemistry has been used. Um, I can't mention the specific one, but there are contact lenses which can now be in the eye for far longer than when they initially came out. And that's a surface chemical modification, um, which allows them to be worn comfortably um, for more than, well, for at least 24 hours. In terms of bacterial colonization of for medical devices, um, they tend to be ones which you don't want to remove. So let's say you've got an implanted medical device, um, take the most common one, um, a hip joint or a, a, a cardiac stent, which more and more people have now, you can get infection, infections associated with those. And if you do, that means you have to actually remove them um, which means operating on the patient again, great risk to them and um, discomfort. And uh, in some cases, when you're trying to, uh, um, when you have a hip joint or a knee joint or something like that, there's a limited number of what are called revisions that are possible um, because of the damage it causes every time you you undertake such a, uh, an operation of c cementing in or or, dry, or or inserting in a, a, a large piece of metal. There isn't really the option to clean them. Um, well, well, I mean, they go in sterile, but what, but once they're in, they can become colonized by bacteria, which don't necessarily come from a, an unclean environment, but can come from the body itself. I was just going to say, I've been thinking while you've been talking, Morgan, about, you know, how our body really doesn't have many uh, areas, contexts within which you have a solid surface that can be colonized. The really obvious one is our teeth. And, you know, we <laughs> work very hard to remove the colonize, the bacterial colonization of those. And we have to, otherwise well, we, we all know what would happen. Um, so, yes, yeah, so then, I, you know, I, I think um, there is a place for both. And, and there has to be, I think we need to use both antimicrobial um, materials and cleaning and there's a context for both so i think absolutely within the context of medical devices where you know you're not going to be taking out a catheter and using a pipe cleaner on it every i don't know twice a day or something like that <laughs> you definitely no 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 thanks um it totally makes sense to have an antimicrobial coating however let's say you know on a grab pole on the tube it's probably going to get too much rough interactions with it and you might then end up disturbing the the chemistry of, of the surface and the and then it's you know it, it won't be fit for purpose so i think some places better to clean some places where you can't clean antimicrobial materials are, are really useful in terms of covid 19 like people have really been thinking about cleaning a lot more and you know if say morgan you you develop a, a whole plethora of different, you know, materials, different methods for different sort of use cases. So like I go mm -hmm. back to the tube, but like train, you know, if you have, you know, a specific coating for Perspex glass, um, yeah. if you have specific coating for a grab pole and then for mm -hmm. chairs, it's yeah. very then you can't then go to cleaners and be like, you have to use this spray here. You have to use this something else here. You have to use something else for the Perspex thing. So is that I, a worry? I, I would be more optimistic, I think, um, because although I, I've kind of stressed that it's the first couple of nanometers that's important in, in terms of the identity of the material that um, in, determines how the cells, the bacterial cells or other cells respond to the surface, these materials can be made as thick coatings. You could think of them as uh, sort of the of the thickness of paint for example that you put on your wall it doesn't have to be done like that it could be painted like you paint a car um, and you don't think of that paint as being um you know too Scrub delicate offable. yes yeah you know you wash your car in the same ways as um and, and it remains pretty good for quite a long time and and i think so i think there is you could be optimistic and say that you could find materials which are suitable for those environments which would reduce not eliminate but reduce the bacterial colonization 
Um, it's just that we haven't really um, looked for them till very recently. With COVID, obviously, it was a massive um, boost in terms of um, uh, looking at surfaces. So with that in mind, like how much does this have an impact on human health? Because, you know, COVID, like you say, has opened lots and lots of doors to thinking about these things. So in terms of that, have there been lessons from COVID where we've thought about materials and thinking about material choices, thinking about human health? Has that been a thing? It's, it's notoriously difficult to pinpoint a specific transmission event. So like, I touched this pole and then I picked my nose and that started a respiratory infection. So most of this sort of transmission pathways science, con- you know, arena has been more about trying to quantify the level of risk and then and trying to reduce that risk by various interventions. Um, so, you know, from the point of view of COVID, do you remember initially we were all like desperately cleaning our hands, wiping down our shopping, all of this stuff. But then as time went on, it turned out that actually it looked like it, it was more of a airborne transmission pathway and, and sort of close contact with someone not necessarily breathing the same air, being within the same household, not necessarily like close contact, like cuddling for I don't know, a period of time, so then you get something. We we haven't quantified exactly how surfaces contribute, how many of these infections are as a result of uh, transmission of a pathogen via surface versus through the air versus through, I don't know what, close contact versus all of the other pathways. It's, It's really difficult to be able to quantify that and then also if you you know you could potentially do some sort of trial where you know you have one ward that has some surfaces that are coated and another one that doesn't and see whether you get a difference in the a number of healthcare associated infections but is that difference going to be because of the surfaces or is, or is it just something else? So it's sort of notoriously difficult to prove the effectiveness. <laughs> to to summarise, you, you, uh, you could summarise that and say, well, it's, it's certainly probably not a good thing to have highly pathogenic bacteria on your hands. Yes, But it's very difficult true. to quantify what the transmission um, res- what the result of that transmission or that passage is. What you're sort of saying, I think what both of you have been saying, there's a lot of compromise, real world compromise that happens, taking things from the lab into the real world. A lot of factors change, how people use things change, like everything changes. You know, there's no perfect world where we can translate stuff that, you know, Morgan does in the lab, you know, stuff that you see in the real world into like a, a, a microbiological utopia. But exactly. because we only have a few minutes left, um, just jumping forward now in the next sort of 5, 10, 20 years, do you both feel optimistic about what we're going to see? Keep it brief, but you know, are there any things that make you feel very optimistic? I'm optimistic um, because we <laughs> now have materials, um, and maybe this is because I'm a material scientist that I'm optimistic, but we now have materials which are showing um, real world applicability at reducing bacterial biofilms on medical devices. And that may sound like it's self centered because it's from my group, um, but the reason I, I think that's uh, exciting is because it's the first instance of that happening. So even if the ones which have come out of our group um, uh, don't become widely adopted, I think the approach in itself is going to be recognized as being useful and therefore that will offer an alternative to the killing approach, which is the most widely tried and in many cases failed approach which has been used up to this point and we need to reduce infections in medical devices because as we know uh, health services are um, at breaking point as it is and so anything we can do to reduce the burden of um, everyday medical devices causing uh, infections which are unrelated to the condition that they're designed to treat is is going to hopefully help relieve that pressure that, that the, our health services are under. <laughs> so, Lena, Lena, I'll, I'll read you the question for you. It's my final question of this uh, today. It is, 
if okay. you could have one thing that the listener goes away, one key takeaway for our listeners, what would it be from your perspective? There's a real lack of understanding of the microbial world, of the microbial world generally. Um, and, you know, I, 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 think, I think basically trying to incorporate more about microbes and how we interact with them and how we live together and, and so on and how they can cause diseases, but also, you know, help us f- from primary school onwards means that people will have a better understanding of how to interact with them in a, in a better way you know like and and there is real nuance to it and it is really complex so you know some places you do need to clean really well some places you don't necessarily and actually better not to clean everywhere because you do want to expose yourself to some of these microbes because that's good for your immune system especially as a child that is quite a complex message to put out um so i think the more people understand and embrace the fact that these things are all around us and and that's fine and and in in many ways it's good means that then there would there'll be fewer infections that's right everyone you should start off the day taking the circle line on the tube just like the, you know make yourself feel good that that will help you yeah. that will boost your immune system you know. yeah no more no more multivitamins now nah, take the central line for a little bit boost yourself <laughs> yeah, that, that makes complete sense. Well, thank you so much, both of you, uh, today. It's been fantastic. I've learned so much. And that's all from us today. Thank you so much for listening. And please make sure you join us for our final episode in this series on antimicrobial resistance. Now, we're going around the world and speaking with experts who can give us a more holistic perspective on what antimicrobial resistance is like for humanity across the globe. You can't miss this episode because I get to speak to former Chief Medical Officer Dr. Sally Davis. That's right, I've made it. We've made it. You have to make it. See you next time.